Chapter Eleven of the Hoosier Schoolmaster by Edward Eggleston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. Chapter Eleven. Miss Martha Hawkins. It's very good for the health to dig in the elements. I was quite emaciated last year at the east, and the doctor told me to dig in the elements. I got me a floral hoe and dug, and it's been most excellent for me. Time. The Saturday following the Friday, on which Ralph kept Shockey company as far as the forks near Granny Sanders's house. Scene. The Squire's Garden. Ralph helping that worthy magistrate perform sundry little jobs, such as a warm winter day suggests to the farmer. Miss Martha Hawkins, the squire's niece, and his housekeeper in his present bereaved condition, leaning over the palings, pickets she called them, of the garden fence, talking to the master. Miss Hawkins was recently from Massachusetts. How many people there are in the most cultivated communities whose education is partial? "'It's very common for schoolmaster to dig in the elements at the east,' proceeded Miss Martha. "'Like many other people born in the celestial empires, of which there are three, China, Virginia, Massachusetts, Miss Martha was not averse to reminding outside barbarians of her good fortune in this regard.' It did her good to speak of the East. Now Ralph was amused with Miss Martha. She really had a good deal of intelligence, despite her affectation. And conversation with her was both interesting and diverting. It helped him to forget Hannah, and Bud, and the robbery, and all the rest. And she was so delighted to find somebody to make an impression on that she had come out to talk while Ralph was at work. But just at this moment the schoolmaster was not so much interested in her interesting remarks, nor so much amused by her amusing remarks as he should have been. He saw a man coming down the road riding one horse and leading another, and he recognized the horses at a distance. It must be Bud who was riding Means's bay mare and leading Bud's roan colt. Bud had been to mill, and as the man who owned the horse mill kept but one old blind horse himself, it was necessary that Bud should take two. It required three horses to run the mill. The old blind one could have ground the grist, but the two others had to overcome the friction of the clumsy machine. But it was not about the horse mill that Ralph was thinking, nor about the two horses. Since that Wednesday evening on which he escorted Hannah home from the spelling school, he had not seen Bud Means. If he had any lingering doubts of the truth of what Mirandy had said— they had been dissipated by the absence of Bud from school. When I was to Boston, Miss Martha was to Boston only once in her life, but as her visit to that sacred city was the most important occurrence of her life, she did not hesitate to air her reminiscences of it frequently. When I was to Boston, she was just saying, when following the indication of Rolf's eyes, she saw Bud coming up the hill near Squire Hawkins' house. Bud looked red and sulky, and to Rolf's and Miss Martha Hawkins' polite recognitions he returned only a surly nod. They both saw that he was angry. Rolf was able to guess the meaning of his wrath. Toward evening Rolf strolled through the squire's cornfield toward the woods. The memory of the walk with Hannah was heavy upon the heart of the young master, and there was comfort in the very miserableness of the cornstalks with their disheveled blades— hanging like tattered banners and rattling discordantly in the rising wind. Wandering without purpose, Ralph followed the rows of stalks first one way and then the other in a zigzag line, turning a right angle every minute or two. At last he came out in a woods mostly of beech, and he pleased his melancholy fancy by kicking the dry and silky leaves before him in billows. While the soughing of the wind through the long, vibrant boughs and slender twigs of the beech forest seemed to put the world into the wailing minor key of his own despair. What a fascination there is in a path come upon suddenly, without a knowledge of its termination! Here was one running in easy, irregular curves through the wood, now turning gently to the right in order to avoid a stump, now swaying suddenly to the left to gain an easier descent at a steep place, and now turning wantonly to the one side or the other, as if from very caprice in the man who by idle steps unconsciously marked the line of the footpath at first. Rolf could not resist the impulse, who could, to follow the path and find out its destination, and following it he came presently into a lonesome hollow, 
where a brook gurgled among the heaps of bare limestone rocks that filled its bed. Following the path still, he came upon a queer little cabin built of round logs, in the midst of a small garden patch enclosed by a brush fence. The stick chimney, daubed with clay and topped with a barrel open at both ends, made this a typical cabin. It flashed upon Ralph that this place must be Rocky Hollow, and that this was the house of old John Pearson, the one-legged basket-maker, and his rheumatic wife, the house that hospitably sheltered Shockey. Following his impulse, he knocked and was admitted, and was not a little surprised to find Miss Martha Hawkins there before him. "'You here, Miss Hawkins?' he said when he had returned Shockey's greeting, and shaken hands with the old couple. "'Bless you, yes,' said the old lady. "'That blessed girl!' The old lady called her a girl, by a sort of figure of speech, perhaps. "'That blessed girl's the kindest creeter you ever saw. Comes here every day, most, to cheer a body up with something or another. Miss Martha blushed, and said she came because Rocky Hollow looked so much like a place she used to know at the East. Mr. and Mrs. Pearson were the kindest people. They reminded her of people she knew at the East. When she was to Boston, here the old basket-maker lifted his head from his work, and said, Pshaw, that talk about kindness. He was a Kentuckian, and said, Kindness is all humbug. I wonder so smart a woman as you don't know better. You come nearer to bein' kind than anybody I know. But laws a me, we're all selfish accordin' to my tell. You wasn't selfish when you set up with my father most every night for two weeks, said Shockey, as he handed the old man a splint. Yes, I was, too, this in a tone that made Rolf tremble. Your father was a miserable Britisher. I'd fit redcoats in the War of 1812, and lost my leg by one of em stickin' his dog on bagonet right through it, that night at Lundy's Lane. But my messmate killed him, though, which is a satisfaction to think on. And I didn't like your father, cause he was a Britisher. But if he'd a died right here in this free country, though nobody to give him a drink of water, blamed if I wouldn't a been ashamed to set on the platform at a Fourth of July barbecue, and to hold up my wooden leg for to make the boys cheer. That was the selfishest thing I ever done. We're all selfish, according to my tell. You wasn't selfish when you took me in that night, you know, and Shockey's face beamed with gratitude. Yes, I war too, you little sassbox. What did I take you fur? Hey, because I didn't like Pete Jones nor Bill Jones. They're thieves, dog on em. Rolf shivered a little. The horse with a white forefoot and white nose galloped before his eyes again. They're a set of thieves, that's what they air. Please, Mr. Pearson, be careful. You'll get into trouble, you know, by talking that way, said Miss Hawkins. You're just like a man that I knew at the East. Why, do you think an old soldier like me, hobbling on a wooden leg, is afraid of them thieves? Didn't I face the Britishers? Didn't I come home late last Wednesday night? I rather guessed I must a took a little too much at Welch's grocery, and laid down in the middle of the street to rest. The boys thought twas funny to crate me. I woke up kind of cold, bout one in the mornin'. Bout two o'clock I come up Means as Hill, and didn't I see Pete Jones, and them others that robbed the Dutchman? And somebody, I dunno who, a crossin' in the blue grass pasture towards Joneses? Rolf shivered. Don't shake your finger at me, old woman. Tongue is all I've got to fight with now, but I'll fight them thieves till the sea goes dry, I will. Shocky, give me a splint. But you wasn't selfish when you tuck me. Shocky stuck to his point most positively. Yes, I was, you little tow-headed fool. I didn't take you case I was good, not a bit of it. I hated Bill Jones what keeps the poor house, and I knowed him and Pete would get you bound to some of their clique, and I didn't want no more thieves raised. So when your mother hobbled, with you a lead in her, poor blind thing, all the way over here on that winter night, and said, Mr. Pearson, you're all the friend I've got, and I want you to save my boy. Why, you see, I was selfish as ever I could be in taking of you. Your mother's cryin' sot me a-cryin' too. We're all selfish in everything, accordin' to my tell. Blamed if we hadn't, Miss Hawkins. Only sometimes I'd think you was real benevolent if I didn't know we were all selfish. End of chapter 11